All right. Well, as Ollie says, a uh, very warm welcome to you this morning, whether you're online with us or whether you're here in person at 140 Clark Street. And a happy Thanksgiving to everyone this weekend. My name is Mark. I'm one of the leaders here at Christ Central Church. And uh, as we heard at the start of the meeting, we're continuing to adapt to the current regulations regarding COVID-19. So thank you, everyone here for wearing a mask. I know not, it's not the easiest thing to do throughout the whole of our meeting, but well done for uh, doing it. And uh, we're protecting others by doing that as well. And uh, sometimes it can be difficult to sing our songs of worship um, when we feel as though we're muffled. But you know, God sees our hearts and there's many ways that we can worship and praise God as well. So the Bible talks about dancing and moving our bodies and clapping our hands. So maybe some of these are the ways that we're going to have to really press into in expressing our worship to God over the coming weeks and months, as well as obviously singing as best we can. Just to be clear, um, we did check with public health and they said that anyone singing or speaking with amplification during our meetings don't need to wear a mask. Uh, so uh, I, just so you know, we're not ignoring the rules and, uh, and just doing what we want. And also, if you are contributing from the microphone, over here during that time when you're bringing your contribution, you can remove your mask if you wish, you don't need to. It's entirely your choice, but you're allowed to do that if you wish to do so. All right, as well as it being Thanksgiving uh, this morning, it's the first of our two gift day Sundays, and we're thrilled uh, that we're able to do that this year. We weren't able to do a gift day back in April, um, as we normally would have done, but uh, we're so excited to be here in this building and uh, increasingly we're able to make it look uh, really good. Uh, I love this picture. Um, I don't know what you call it. It's more than a picture, isn't it? It's <laughs> an amazing display of artwork that Brittany created for us uh, the last few weeks. And it's so good that those are here. We've got some banners up around the room now. It's looking great. Thanks to Brent for designing and, uh, and actually putting those up as well. But as we outlined at our Vision Sunday a few weeks back, we're looking to head to renovate this space, this building that we've got more and more so that we're able to provide a number of other things. We'll be able to provide more uh, rooms that children can uh, be taught in and other activities can go on. We're looking to provide better ventilation, better heating for in here as well, uh, better acoustics. Um, so we are holding our gift day, which will be a little different this year because we're not allowed to pass baskets around. You should have um, found a little piece of paper on your seats if you're in here, and I'll explain if you're not here, just how you can take part in our gift day this, this year. The main way that we can give is online. Um, if you want to do um, electronic, now what's it called, e-transfer, I always forget what it's called, e-transfer. That's where you can very simply just go and uh, you can give through your bank and you just put giving at christcentral.ca as your recipient. You've got to mark that it's for gift day and then you can put your amount in and we can do it that way very easily and there's no fees involved in that which is a great way to be able to give. You can also give via Tithely which is uh, an app um, and you can do that through our website as well. Uh, the Tithely app and again very easy to do. There is, a, there is some fees associated with that um, that either it will ask you if you want to cover or the church will cover. Either way is fine, um, but uh, that's another way you can give. Um, you can give via cash or checks if you're here in person. We've got a mailbox which is just over uh, in the entrance area on the wall, and you can put your checks or your cash in there this week and next week as well. And there's a way that you can uh, write on this little slip of paper that you've got here, you can pledge some money. So if you think, actually, I want to give, and this is the amount I want to give, you can put a pledge, you can put it in the mailbox, then you can either redeem that online uh, when you're at home, or you can redeem it next week or in future weeks as well. So lots of different ways that we can give towards the gift there. Please come um, and ask God, what do you want me to give towards this? And uh, for everyone, it will be different. It's a faith response that we're looking for and uh, we hope that you're able to do that. If you're visiting us, if you're not regularly with us, if you just feel, you know what, I don't feel I can right now, that's absolutely fine as well. We're just so glad that you're here with us. A couple of other things before I get into my message. We're starting our online alpha course 
um, this Wednesday. And if you would like to do that, that's uh, going to be run by Zoom again. It's all online. It's a great way to explore the Christian faith, discuss any questions that you might have about God. So let me know uh, if you um, want to sign up or if you've got anyone else that you know who wants to sign up as well. Or just send an email to someone who is in some form of leadership in the church, and I'm sure they'll pass it on to me as well, and I will get in touch with people. And finally, if you've got any remaining one big question cards, we've been doing that these last few weeks. Um, today is your last day to return those, and again, you can put those in the mailbox over there as well, or go onto our website and input the questions that people have asked, and we're going to use those questions to um, form some of our um, topics for our meetings in November. All right. So here is today's big question. Today, today's big question is this. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? It was a question that was asked in a book that our kids had at a very young age. Here's the book, and you can see it on the screen as well. Where is Jesus? Our kids used to love this book. It was a kind of one of those lift the flap books. Again, you can see, um, if we put another slide up, it was one of these lift the flat books where you, it says, where is Jesus? And you open it up, and uh, there it tells you where he is. So that one is, he's in the temple. And there he is, dancing and praising uh, God. Where is Jesus? It went through all the time. You know, he was at eating supper. He was, uh, he was praying in the garden. Uh, this one is towards the end. Where is Jesus? It was the tomb, and you open it up, and it says, not here. I don't know if you can see the not here. Not here. Where is Jesus? Our kids used to absolutely love it. So uh, where is Jesus? There's the question. He's not in the tomb. He's not here. But where is he? Well, I wonder if anyone's got any ideas where Jesus is. Maybe let's start with some of the kids or some of our teenagers. Where is Jesus today? Any ideas? Yes, Micah. Heaven. Heaven. Okay. Okay. So then I'm going to ask you a further question. You can think about it and come back to him in a minute. Where is heaven? All right, that's a good question. You can have a little think. I'm going to come back to you, Micah. Yeah, where is Jesus? Any other ideas or anyone want to say where heaven might be? <laughs> his brother put his hand down for him. I love that. He's like, get down. <laughs> Go ahead, tell me where you think heaven is, Micah. You think heaven is somewhere between space and out of time. Cool. Or it could be in the sky. All right. I like it. I love it when people give an answer and they reference something in the Bible. That's cool. Well done, Aiden. All right, where is Jesus? That's the question we're going to ask, okay? So that's what I'd like you all to be thinking about. There's lots of different potential answers that lots of people have given. A Jehovah's Witness would say, well, Jesus rose spiritually, and then he returned to earth in 1914, and he's been ruling on the earth ever since. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Uh, many Muslims would say, Jesus was taken up to heaven like Enoch or Elijah, but they would say that he never did die on the cross. He didn't die on the cross, but that God just took him away up to heaven. An Orthodox Jew would say, Jesus is dead in the ground. He was never raised. He died and he stayed dead. If you ever read the Da Vinci Code novel, which was very popular a number of years ago, um, that would say Jesus went to France uh, with his wife. <laughs> uh, it's a novel, but some people really believed what was in the Da Vinci Code. Why would he go to France is the question. <laughs> what would Christians say? What would Christians say? To be honest, a lot of Christians aren't overly clear about it. It's one of those questions. Some people think that Jesus was God. Jesus was God, and then he stopped being God, and he became human, and he lived on earth, and then he stopped being human, and he went back to being God again. Some people think that. 
So they kind of think, well, Jesus is now invisible, like God the Father is invisible. In fact, it's pretty easy to confuse him with God the Father with that answer. You know, you think, oh, Jesus is God, but what's the difference between Jesus and God the Father? Some people say, oh, Jesus is with us everywhere. Jesus is here all around us. He's everywhere, especially with those people who are believers. Uh, that can get a little confusing. It can get confusing with the Holy Spirit. We can confuse Jesus with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit um, is present with believers and fills us, um, but we can get confused. The Bible says God is three distinct persons. God is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we can think, okay, God is the Son, Jesus is the Son. We can kind of get our heads around the man, the historical man, Jesus, when he was living here on earth, the Jesus of the Gospels. We can kind of get our heads around that a bit easier, but, but where, what about now? Where is Jesus now? That can be a difficult question. Thank you for the answers that were given. We're going to turn to the book of Acts. We're going to look at Scripture to see where Jesus is, and we're going to start off in the book of Acts because we've been doing a series on the book of Acts, and we're um, just at verse 9 of chapter 1, but we're going to read the whole of the first uh, chapter until verse 11. We're going to look at verse 9 to 11 today mainly. Here it goes. It says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. There you go, you got the answer. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion when he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, well, it's not for you to know the dates or times the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking it intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand looking here into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. All right. So we see that this passage in Acts gives us part of of the answer. Jesus starts off in the passage in Jerusalem. He's been appearing to his disciples over a number of different occasions, over a period of 40 days. And then on this day, he's suddenly taken up from his disciples, taken up, and a cloud hides him from their sight. And the disciples are looking up into the sky, and these two men, or these two angels, pretty much is what they were, men dressed in white, stand beside them, and they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up at the sky? I would have thought that was a pretty obvious answer to that question. Um, Jesus, who they've just been speaking with, is suddenly taking away from them, and he goes up behind a cloud. Of course, that's what you're looking at. Um, you, you're like, wow, what's, what's going on? If my kids lose something, I always say, we'll go back to the last place that you saw it. And uh, so I guess that's what they were doing. <laughs> they're standing there and they're like, well, okay, Jesus has just gone into this cloud and let's just stick around and wait to see what happens next. And the angels have to come and they say, look, no, this isn't what you're supposed to be doing now. Don't just go and look up into the sky. Um, Jesus isn't going to be coming back right now, basically. He's not going to be coming back. He will come back, but he's not coming back now. This isn't like any of the other appearances that have happened over the past 40 days where Jesus would come and he'd appear with his disciples and then he would go again, he'd come and go, come and go. So yes, he was going to be returning. He is going to be returning one day in a similar way to that they've just seen him go. But now he's gone to heaven and so they have to do what Jesus has just told them to do, which is stay in Jerusalem 
and wait for the baptism of the Spirit. And after you've received the baptism of the Spirit, you'll be my witnesses, Jesus' witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And we'll see exactly what happened when we get into chapter 2. So, is that it then for Jesus? Is that the end of Jesus' involvement with the disciples or the apostles, as they're going to be known? Apostles means sent one. In a way, yes. Jesus isn't going to be physically with them the way that he's been with them up until now. Things are going to change. He's not going to be physically present with us, but God is still going to be with them through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would now be with those men, and more than them, it's going to go out to anyone who follows Jesus. He's present with us. So instead of Jesus' presence being with them, the Holy Spirit's presence would be with them. But what about Jesus? Well, the angel said, well, he's in heaven now. That was the answer that we got so helpfully from Micah. He's in heaven. But what does that mean? What does it mean he's in heaven? Is he, is he still on that cloud? Is he on a cloud? I mean, the cloud hid him from sight. Is, is Jesus sitting on a cloud? Has he got his feet up? Does he, does he still have feet? Or is he invisible? What, what, what's the answer to that? What, what's Jesus actually doing? What is heaven? Where is heaven? Again, some good answers that were given. Lots of Christians aren't sure about the answers to those questions. But actually, understanding the answer to those questions can really, really help us. So Jesus is in heaven, and he is alive. But we need to realize he's alive with a physical body. Jesus hasn't suddenly just become a spirit. I mean, that was the whole point of the resurrection. That's why the fact that Jesus rose physically is so important. I mean, Jesus didn't just come to die for our sins, as amazing as that is. I mean, and it is amazing. Jesus came and he died for our sins. He was a sacrifice for us so that we could be forgiven, so that we could know God. But he didn't, he didn't just give his life as a sacrifice. Jesus was raised from the dead as well. That shows that death has been defeated. Death has been defeated. And then he ascended into heaven as a physical person. The ascension shows us he's still alive. He didn't die, was raised, live for a while longer, and then die again. Now, that happened to Lazarus. You remember Lazarus? Lazarus was Jesus' friend who was dead. Jesus went, called him out of the tomb. He was raised to life again. Lazarus is not still alive. Lazarus died again and was buried in the ground. He didn't stay alive. Jesus, that didn't happen to him. He's still alive. The ascension shows us that he's still alive. And he wasn't a ghost. That's the whole point of what was said here to the disciples earlier on in this chapter of Acts. Jesus made very sure that during these 40 days he appeared to them and it says he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. It wasn't just because they thought he was a ghost. And so he he got them to touch him and say, put your hands in my wounds. He got them, he said, give me some fish to eat. He ate with them. He ate fish. And there was many things that he did. He said, hey, I am physically raised from the dead. I'm not a ghost. Now, there were some things that he did which were like, "Whoa, how have you done that, Jesus? But he was, he was making sure that they understood he wasn't just a ghost. He wasn't just some sort of spirit. He was physically alive again. He was a physical human being. And that physical human being, Jesus ascended to heaven. So the next question is, so where is heaven? Well, people have debated where heaven is. Some people before you could fly and things like that, and before you could travel into space, people said, oh, heaven is is where the stars are. Heaven is above the clouds. Well, yeah. We have to think about heaven as a 
a different kind of space, a different kind of matter, God's new space. Heaven, as it exists now, is a realm which is generally invisible to people living on earth. Although the Bible does talk about people who saw glimpses of it. So, great answer, Aidan. In, um, in the Old Testament, it talks about a stairway going to heaven, which appeared that uh, Jacob um, saw. It also talks in lots of different places about heaven being seen, heaven opening. Um, Paul talks about how he was caught up into heaven. He says, oh, I know a man. He's talking about himself. He was caught up into heaven. Stephen, when he was martyred, the first martyr, um, one of the early believers and followers of Jesus, was killed. He was stoned to death, and it said that when he was being stoned to death, he saw heaven open, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. We'll see that later on in the book of Acts. Jesus, at his baptism, saw heaven open, and the Spirit of God descend on him like a dove. Um, Elisha's servant Gehazi had revealed to him something of heaven. He saw horses and chariots of fire just before Elijah was taken up into heaven. So heaven is this realm, is this, this place that God has got, this different uh, space, which on the whole is invisible, but sometimes people have been allowed to see. C.S. Lewis is one of the people who has explain this the best. And he's explained it in his stories, which many children read, um, but it's not just a children's story. He's explained it in his Chronicles of Narnia series. Many people will know those books, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, other novels as well. And he talks about Narnia. And Narnia is this place which is interconnected with earth, but it's separate from earth. It's a place where time is different to here. It's a physical place. It's a physical place where Aslan rules, where battles take place against the forces of evil. Sometimes those forces look to be winning, but Aslan always overcomes, has the final victory. When you get to the final book in that series, the last battle that C.S. Lewis wrote, we see Narnia and England, which was where the children were living in those books, recreated and then joined together to form a place which it describes as better than England and better than Narnia, where Aslan reigns forever. And C.S. Lewis, as he's writing those books, he's trying to explain something of what the Bible describes about heaven and earth. Heaven and earth are different, but they're not very far away from each other, and they're interconnected. And the Bible says one day they will be joined together in a new way. One day, they'll be open. One day, they'll be visible to each other. We'll be able to see them. So one day, the human Jesus will return. We'll see him again face to face. We'll be able to see him. And uh, the new heavens and the new earth will come, and they will be joined together, and we will live there forever. That's what the Bible talks about. That's what the Bible talks about. And we can read about that in, in any number of the Old Testament books, especially Revelation. But for now, Jesus is in heaven. So we might not be able to see him now, and we will see him again one day. But he is in heaven, and he is very real, and he is very active. And I want us to look at a few more passages today before we finish, which will hopefully give us some encouragement and hope in difficult times. So, what is Jesus like in heaven? Some people might need to change how we see Jesus. A lot of people, I think, mainly guys, maybe, get turned off by the image of Jesus, which we have much of the time. We sp I, I think a few weeks ago I was speaking and I said, um, sometimes we can think of Jesus as this blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy, long hair, very much in touch with his feminine side, very gentle and meek and mild. Of course, Jesus did come to earth, and he did take on the form of a servant. He was uh, meek, and he, he, uh, you know, he did have those qualities. But Jesus wasn't only like that. The New Testament doesn't just say Jesus is like that. 
especially the risen Lord Jesus. Let's look at some of the descriptions in the Bible of the risen Lord Jesus. Revelation 19 and uh, verse 11 says, uh, I saw heaven standing open. So John's seeing into heaven. John's got a glimpse into heaven, into this new space. This is what he sees. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is faithful and true. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like um, blazing fire. So this is Jesus, okay? His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp sword to which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Woo! Exactly. What an image of God. What an image of God, of Jesus. White horse, eyes like blazing fire. His robe dripped in blood. He's got, his, he's got tattooed on his, on his thigh, king of kings, lord of lords. Some Christians still say, oh, he shouldn't have tattoos. Um, Jesus has got one. <laughs> he's got it written on his thigh. And he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. He's not a guy to be messed with. This is the image of the risen Lord Jesus. This is Jesus who is alive now. In Revelation 4, we see a picture of Jesus sat on the throne in heaven, surrounded by 24 other thrones with elders sitting on them and four living creatures like an ox and a lion and an eagle and a man with wings. And they're all worshiping Jesus. And there's flashes of lightning and peals of thunder coming out from the throne, and Jesus is seated, sitting there, ruling and reigning as Lord and King and warrior and Savior, because that's who sat on thrones, kings, priests, warriors. Jesus is in heaven, and he's ruling, and he's reigning. It's like his command center. He's at the helm of the world, and he's ruling, and he's reigning all the time, not just when we might feel like it, he is, not just when we think we feel him, no, that is where Jesus is. That is what Jesus is doing. And we see it in other parts of the Bible as well. Psalm 110 verse 1 gives us a glimpse, Old Testament. It says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Son is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And the Father is saying, your enemies are going to be like a footstool for you. You're going to put your feet on them. You've defeated them. You will defeat them. That was in the Old Testament, but it's a very similar passage to the one in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 through 23. And Paul's talking about God's power. And he's saying this power is available to all of us through the Spirit who believe. And he says that power, which is available to us, let's remember that, that power is the same as his mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ Jesus from the dead. And then he gives us a bit of detail what's happened to Jesus here. And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, over and, ta over and dominion, uh, authority and dominion. And every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, that same image from Psalms, and appointed him to be head over everything, everything, for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills him in every way. Jesus has still got this power and authority. Jesus has got authority over the world, over every rule, every power, every authority that exists. And it always has been the case, and it always will be the case. Everything is under his feet. Everything is under his feet. And who's it for? Paul says, it's for us. It's for the church, his body, you know, we need to realize this is what Jesus is doing. He's ruling and reigning over every power and authority, and he's doing it for the church. So us, as the church, Jesus, we need to know, Jesus can help us. Jesus can help us because we can pray to him, 
And he'll answer our prayers because he's ruling and reigning over this earth. He's ruling over our lives from heaven. And we can rule him, we can, sorry, we can worship him with reverent fear. And actually, it's right to have some fear. It's right to have some fear in a good way. Because yes, God loves us and he's our father and he's adopted us and all of those things. But look at the picture of the Lord Jesus who is reigning, reigning and ruling. I mean, that should give us some, whew, we can have a right fear of him. We're not just going to treat him casually. He's not just our best buddy. He's God. He's God. He's the risen Lord Jesus, and his throne is over all creation, all powers, all nations, all kingdom, all principalities. He's over all people at all times and in all places and in all circumstances. He's over all religions. He's over all the different perspectives that people have got in the world, all the ideolo ideologies, all preferences. Jesus is sovereign. Nothing is out of the control of his hand. Nothing. He's over everything. Everything. These days, people, many of us worry about saying that. I think, oh, we're going to get into trouble by saying that. Well, we might get into trouble with people by saying that. But that's what Scripture tells us, and it's true. So that's what we hold on to. Colossians 1. I'm just reading a lot of Bible verses because it's important for us to get hold of some of these things. And I know many of these things we're going to have to go back and look at maybe in our own time and just meditate on, to dwell on. Colossians 1, 16 to 18. In him, in Jesus, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him, all things now hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that in him everything, in everything, he might have the supremacy. This is a big Jesus. This is a big Jesus. If we only see Jesus of the Gospels, and that's an amazing thing to see and understand the Jesus of the Gospels. I'm not diminishing that. But if that's all we see of Jesus, if that's all we think of of Jesus, we might be in danger of seeing a diminished Jesus, a smaller Jesus than God wants us to see. Let's lift our eyes this morning to see Jesus as he really is, on his throne, high and exalted, ruling and reigning over everyone and everything. Because when we see him like that, we are undone. And some people might say, well, looking at the world, it doesn't really look like he's ruling and reigning. It looks like the world's in a mess. But the early church knew the world was in a mess back in the day. But they also knew there was a new king in charge. And their job was to announce it to the world, to announce his kingdom to the world. Their job wasn't to come and tell people how they should live their lives, some kind of theocracy. This is how you've got to live. We're not appointed by God to make sure everyone lives to God's standards. But we don't ignore what's going on in the world either and hide ourselves away. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5 says, What we preach isn't ourselves, but it's Jesus Christ as Lord. And ourselves are servants for Jesus' sake. We can tell the world about the King Jesus ruling and reigning. And the way that we show the world is by coming energized by the Spirit into the world. And we come vulnerable, suffering, praising, praying, misunderstood, misjudged, vindicated, celebrating. All of the things that the Bible tells us to do. We bear in our body the death of Jesus, it says, so the life of Jesus may be displayed. That's how we show people Jesus. We come in the same way that he came. We are not coming as Lord and all-powerful, but he is that. Jesus is Lord over everything. And it says no one comes to the Father except through him. I think someone prayed that out this morning or the verse just before that. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And people might say, well, that's a bit exclusive. That's a bit exclusive, isn't it? Well, in some ways, I guess, it's exclusive because he's the only way. He's the only way. 
But it's not exclusive in other ways. It's very inclusive because the Bible tells us that every tribe and every tongue and every nation and every color of skin and every background and every sexual orientation can come to Jesus and repent of their sin and they can trust in him. Everyone. He's the only God who is reigning and ruling over young people and old people, homosexuals, heterosexuals, transsexuals, rich people, poor people, black, white, every nationality, speaking every language, conservative, um, liberal, Republican, Democrat. He's reigning and ruling over every religion. He's reigning and ruling over every generation. That's the Jesus we're talking about. We have to understand that. That is Jesus. And that should give us confidence because all authority has been given to Jesus and he's taken that authority and he said, here's what I want you to do. He's given us jobs to do. He's given us tasks to do. He said, go and make disciples. So that's what we do because he's in charge. He's in charge. It's not an option. He's the king. We to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Ho- and the Holy Spirit. All nations. B- b- what if they've already got their own religion? Surely we have to respect that. Surely we have to respect people's ideologies and opinions and, and their politics and their uh, sexual orientations and their preferences. Yeah, we, we, respe- we, we go respectfully. We respect them. Doesn't mean that Jesus says, don't bother with those people. We're to go to everyone. So we're to make disciples of everyone. Because Jesus is Lord over everyone. The whole earth is accountable to Jesus. Everyone lives under his authority. There is no authority above Jesus. And Philippians 2 verses 9 and 10 says, God exalted Jesus to the highest place. He gave him the name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. One day that's going to happen. One day, everyone is going to acknowledge the truth that Jesus is Lord. When he returns and when he's visible, everyone will see it's true. And right now, much of the world doesn't see that and doesn't acknowledge Jesus as King and Kings and Lord of Lords. But they will one day. And it'll be far better if they acknowledge it before Jesus returns. Because when he does return, the opportunity to be part of his kingdoms and the new heavens and the new earth will be over. And Jesus is going to return one day and he'll rule and reign with us in a new heaven and in a new earth where all sorrow, sickness, sin and death will be no more. He's not just going to snatch us away to heaven leaving the world to its destruction as some popular movies, Christian movies and books would have us believe. It's not about us following Jesus to heaven. Jesus is going to be returning to earth. There's going to be a new heavens and new earth. And he's going to make his kingdom and rule complete and his kingdom will come in its fullness. And he'll bring complete healing to the earth. We don't actually have time to go into all of that today. Maybe Joel will pick it up another time. Or I will. But one day, all of this will happen. So we go and we make disciples now. It's our commission. It's from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Our commander, our ruler, and our reigner. So church, let's be encouraged this morning. Yes, things are difficult. Yes, we have battles. But where is Jesus? He's alive. He's alive. He hasn't left us. He's not forsaken us. He's not abandoned us as orphans. He's right now physically in heaven. The man, Christ, Jesus, ruling and reigning. Despite all the seeming chaos that is going on in the world uh, right now, despite all that might be going on in our lives right now, he is ruling and reigning. He will bring things to completion. He will return. He will join heaven and earth together. And he's going to form something incredible. So let's stir ourselves and encourage ourselves this morning. We're going to worship him right now just as we end our meeting. And then we're going to go and we're going to carry out his great commission to make disciples in our neighborhoods and our city and our nations and to the ends of the earth. Why doesn't the band come back up? Whew, I want to worship Jesus. Even with a mask on, I'm like, whew, come on. Why don't we stand together? Why don't we stand together? I'm just going to pray. Thank you, God for opening our eyes to who you are. Lord, even though, Jesus, you are right now invisible to us, Lord, as we open your word and as we see scripture and as we see 
the truth of who you are and where you are. Oh God, you are opening our eyes again. And I pray by your spirit moving amongst us, Lord, help us to see, help us to get a hold of the truth of who you are, that you are ruling and that you are reigning and that you are Lord of all. And thank you that we are your people and we are in your kingdom. If you have forgiven us and washed us clean, Lord, by your blood and taken us into your family, Lord, we're part of it. And Lord God, I pray that as we go out from here, we will know the truth. We will know the truth and it will encourage us and empower us and sustain us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.